Hey everybody and welcome to MBE Movie News for this Thursday. I am of course John from MBE here to discuss some of the most recent and hopefully exciting movie news to be coming out of Hollywood and Lord knows where else. Probably not China at the moment because sadly they are having to deal with a god awful virus which I, I pray to god doesn't come here. But look, I'm not going to get bogged down with that nonsense. It's all about Harley Quinn or the fantabulous emancipation of Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey of course and it's the latest reviews coming in, the, the early reactions if you'd like for this movie and they are absolutely overwhelming in their positivity and uh, appreciation of this movie. There's been a variety of different people posted up if I can get my iPad to work. Uh, Brandon Davis BD has says on Twitter, uh, Birds of Prey is a lot of fun and violent as hell, that excites me right off the bat. The birds are so entertaining and distinctly different from each other. Ewan McGregor is so sinister and often hilarious. Incidentally, I have to address the elephant in the room. My eye is swelling up like, uh, swelling up like I've been jabbed by Anthony Joshua, but I've got a tiny little thing in it and it's just swelled up to a god-awful level. I look god-awful. Probably even worse than I normally do. So, got that out of the way. Really happy to see Ewan McGregor as playing a sinister antagonist in this movie. Of course, he's playing... Black Mask, I think his name is. Happy to see that it's violent and fun as hell. Uh, and yeah, I'll move on to the very next one. Again, Brandon Davis, he's continued on. If Birds of Prey told me anything, it's that we need a whole lot more Canary and Huntress. They are great, but there's a lot left on the bone well. This is just the beginning of a new horizon for these characters. I'm sure DC and their infinite wisdom, which they possess uh, to crazy levels now, thanks to some shifting at the top at Warner Brothers and DC. I'm sure they will find ways to utilise the best characters coming out of all these different movies they're doing. I'm sure we'll see maybe some spin-offs for Catwoman out of the Batman and whatnot. And these great characters which pop up, if they pop with audience members, wide range of demographics, then I'm absolutely certain we will see these characters once again in other movies in the future. Clarice, uh, if I'm saying that right, Lowry, it says it's so up her street, it's ridiculous, fashionable, weird old ladies breaking men's shins and aggressively complimenting each other. Yes, please and thank you. Well, not sure as, uh, that I'm so keen on the, the breaking men's shins part, but yeah, Clarice or Clarissa, uh, Clarice I think it is. Fair enough, uh, you took that from it, that's your choice and all that jazz. Melissa Thomason has says, Kathy Yan's Birds of Prey is a criminally fun celebration of sisterhood. With some of my favourite fight scenes in recent memory, I was grinning from ear to ear. The entire thing making a pub debut with my review soon. Okay, I don't know what to make of that, but glad to see she enjoyed it. Uh, because I have to tell you, um, the publicity for this movie, or the, the promotion uh, is the better word, hasn't been amazing. Uh, there was two trailer teasers, uh, not teaser trailers. Then we got the first trailer, we got some strange character introductory thing uh, about six, seven months ago. This movie's almost snuck up in me, um, this came out of nowhere. I was speaking to a chap at the uh, football the other week, uh, the weekend, and he reminded me it's coming out uh, very, very soon and it took me by surprise, so I'm glad to see that it is seemingly going over well, albeit these are the same people who usually gush incandescently, if that's the correct word, at just about everything, really. And the fact that it is female centric and these are more liberal leaning sort of people who review these movies then I don't expect them to shit upon it from a great height but I'm glad to see that it does seem to be quite overwhelming in its positivity and maybe a very good movie. I'm certainly going to go and give it a bash if not for Margot Robbie then certainly with very own Ewan McGregor. Uh, Mike Rogu though has come in and says that I am happy to report that it's my favourite modern DC movie yet. Like Shazam, it carves its own path with totally unique aesthetic, action and tone. Margot Ewan and all the rest are 100% fantabulous. I see what you did there, Mike. Why aren't there more roller skate action scenes? Well, that is a question that, that I can't possibly answer, Mike, because I haven't seen the movie. But the fact that there is roller skate action scenes in this, along with the eccentricity of one Margot Robbie's Harlo, Harley Quinn, uh, that excites me as well. Is it going to be my favourite modern day DC movie well it's got big shoes to fill because I really enjoyed Wonder Woman I really enjoyed Shazam and I really really enjoyed Aquaman as well and of course I've admitted time and again that Man of Steel is one of my all time favourite Spider-Man movies I love Henry Cavill's portrayal of that character so 
It's got big old shoes to fill for me. I don't know if it'll take my top spot as my favourite modern DC movie, but I haven't seen it yet, guys, so I can't speak on its artistic merit. I will go through a couple more before I move swiftly onwards. Uh, Laura Prudum has says it's a riot, it's oozing with attitude, and some of the most inventive bone-crunching fight sequences in the superhero genre to date. I went in with low expectations and was pleasantly surprised by how much fun I had. It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it has style to spare. Well, I got that from the promotion, I got that from the trailer. It's got an almost 80s vibe. It's very brightly coloured. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, when you've got Harley Quinn and all these other interesting female protagonists, or anti heroin antagonists, would you call it heroin? Is that the word? I don't know. I'm, I'm saying heroin, the drug. Heroin, her- <laughs> that's limmy. I don't know, man, but look, when you get all of that coming together, you expect it to be colourful with nothing else, and you expect it to have some right old style in there, if you like, right old style, if I can speak the Queen's English. Sorry, guys. Uh, final one I will speak about uh, is probably Eric Davis saying that it has terrific action, humour, and some of the more memorable characters we've seen in a DC movie. Oh, Christ, that's a statement. Uh, but the biggest highlight is Margot Robbie. She is fantabulous as Harley. Well, that's does say it in the title. Uh, while also proving that sometimes our most valued relationships are the ones we have with good food. Well, I completely concur. Eric, my man, I love food. I sit and gorge on cheese sandwiches with cheesy coleslaw and German pork at half one in the morning. So, look, I'm on board for the... The best, most valued relationships being ones that involve good food. Me and my Labrador like to munch together all the time as well. So look, I can cover that. I can cover the rest of it, uh, despite not having seen it. Really excited for this movie. Really happy to see that the early feedback reactions, if you'd like, for this are overwhelming in their positivity. Seems like DC have once again hit the ball out of the park. You wouldn't expect anything less. Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie, match made in heaven. One of the best things from the Suicide Squad. A much maligned movie. Obviously, I think it was David Dyer who did that. But look, she was really, really good. I enjoyed Will Smith as well. And obviously, that guy's well. Um, God, what's his name again? Um, chap from House of Cards. Can't remember his name. There were some good moments in that movie. Uh, and there's certainly enough to work with to go off and do something new with this movie. If it pops in terms of box office. And I'm just happy, man. I'm happy to see DC once again getting finding their stride and hitting the ball out the park with distinctly different standalone movies and not feeling like they have to go after or chase the coattails of Marvel with their big grandiose cinematic universe. But look, guys, I'm going to move on to the second topic on today's show. And it's coming in from Empire. It's all about Nicolas Cage's HP Lovecraft adaptation, Colour Out of Space, getting a bonkers poster now. I'm not going to spend any great deal of time speaking about the poster. No, I am going to focus more. And incidentally, the poster is pretty damn fine. It is colourful. It is zany. Lots of purple. Looks like squid tentacles coming out of a, a strange looking Nicholas Cage. He's wearing his checker shirt, checked shirt, and he's still clinging onto that hairline. I want to know how that man maintains that hairline for so, so long. Lord knows I need a tip because my hair is on its way out. Please tell me, Nicholas. But look, I digress. The poster is very catchy. It's very cool. But no, I'm going to focus on the fact that Nicholas Cage is doing a H.P. Lovecraft movie. Now, I have admitted, I spoke about H.P. Lovecraft, and I think it was David Beinoff and D.B. Weiss were involved in a project to create one or many of the man's works, adapting them onto film. And I admitted then that I haven't read any H.P. Lovecraft novels. I think I'm probably in a, a small minority of the world's population when I say that is the case. So, when I looked into the man and just his seeming brilliance at bringing these horrific monster stories and creatures to life in the form of, obviously, novels and writing, and just the amount of movies it seems to have spawned and the, the juices it seems to have, creative juices it's, it's unleashed and a great many of people who have read the man's work. I have to say, this excites me, having been armed with that extra knowledge. Nicholas Cage stepping into this world, and just the concept of the story as well, it's about a, a man retiring or moving his family away to a remote farmhouse to escape from the frantic nature of city life, uh, and uh, a meteorite crashes down uh, with a, another worldly, indescribable light infecting everyone in 
around the vicinity of the crash site. Now this sends poor old Nick Cage's character absolutely crazy. Um, he obviously goes off and tries to find out what's going on here and just it, it drives him mad. So I think this is the match made in heaven, really. Um, Nick Cage playing a, a eccentric, crazy shit of a man in a movie uh, with in incandescent lights and looks like shape-shifting werewolves and whatnot. This is an absolute match made in heaven. A lot of people love to shite upon Nicolas Cage these days and treat him as a figure of fun, but I think they often forget this man is an Oscar-winning actor and he's appeared in a lot more good movies than probably shite ones, even though the last 10 years or so have been hit or miss. The man himself has admitted that he's going away and doing different movies and just scratching little creative itches that he's got, if you'd like, for lack of a better phrase. And he's doing different things. And we see a lot of actors doing that. Keanu Reeves does that. He'll do big blockbuster movies, make his money, and then he'll go off and scratch creative itches uh, with more independent, wacky stories. And look, Nick is a great actor, man. You can't un underplay the man's ability to be a chameleon and fit into so many different roles. And I think he's made for this role. I'm really excited for it. Excited to see what is going on with this Lovecraft story and what that could maybe open up for potential DBYs and David Bainoff movies in the future. Yeah, man. Not that much more to add to it, sadly, other than to say that it's a really cool poster and I cannot wait to see Nick Cage playing another eccentric character after, I think it was Mandy, where he was wielding chainsaws and Lord knows what else and getting very, very into that character as well. But look, guys, I shall move on. On that note, I'm battering through these topics here because... I'm aware that my eye might start swelling up. I'm looking at the viewfinder just now and it, yeah, it's not good. So I'm trying to get through it very quickly. We have got a review of Just Mercy to do later on tonight, so acutely aware of the time as well. So I'm going to move on and stop talking to the next topic and it's all about Linda Hamilton. This is coming from Cinema Blend and it's a double-pronged article because she is speaking about why she thinks the Terminator franchise may be dead and buried. Um, after its poor box office performance, Dark Fate that is, and just the other thing being that she herself is completely, how, how shall I put it, not nonplussed if you'd like about coming back to this role again, the, the role of Sarah Connor, she doesn't care about it, and she doesn't care if she ever really comes back and portrays it again, which is intriguing because she was very very good as that character once again in Dark Fate. She certainly wasn't the worst thing in that movie. Um, and she brought some of the better moments, certainly the more sombre and poignant moments in the middle of the movie when she's speaking about not being able to remember, obviously, John Connor's face and whatnot. So it's tinged with slight for tragedy, if you like, this topic, because I'd love to see Linda Hamilton coming back and doing more movies, but she seemed to have compartmentalised this part of her life. Uh, she came back out of retirement, I think, to do this movie. And now she's just quite happy to drift back into it and live the life she was leading prior to the movie's release. But does she speak the truth when she says, and I quote, I really think the box office is going to be the thing that killed Terminator. Of course, it's the studios that put hundreds of millions of dollars into a film, but it's just a fickle world in terms of fandom. And maybe they were just worn out by the Terminators that preceded. I don't have any desire to continue. I never did. Well, Sarah, I'm here to tell you, as a big fan of The Terminator, uh, it wasn't The Terminators that preceded that were the problem here. It was Tim Miller uh, and yourself. No, 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 I'll take that back. Not yourself, but the movie you were involved in most recently that was the problem. It was full to the absolute brim with identity politics. It was thrusting beloved characters who had seismic roles to play in the universe prior to this movie into mere footnotes in the history of the Terminator franchise by shooting them before the movie even started. And then you have the director coming out and insulting a wide array of the primary demographic that you are looking to entice in to watch the movie. That was why the movie failed. And that's why the franchise is dead and buried. The franchise is dead and buried as an aside to that because it became too convoluted. There was too many stories going off like Spaghetti Junctions in 50 million different directions. You need charts to try and work out where you are in timelines and it was just it was ridiculous we were going back and forth. This franchise should have been dead and buried after Terminator 2 
Judgment Day. There was nothing left to do with this story. Arnie was in his prime. Linda Hamilton was in her prime. Edward Furlong was still relatively up and coming and had a future in acting before he went off the rails, sadly, like many child actors do. And we really should have stopped after that. Jim Cameron was finished with the franchise after that in terms of directing. He correctly realised that the stories were done. It was a great duology, but for whatever reason, the studio decided that that it wanted to continue ploughing out Average Affair after Average Affair. And it's just been ever-diminishing returns. And Sarah does, Sarah, Linda does um, highlight that later on in the article as well with an additional quote. She says, look, there's no point doing it unless it's truly special. Uh, That's coming back to the character, incidentally. Uh, And there's no point doing it if it's just going to be ever-diminishing returns. And that's what you're going to get. So, yeah, a tinge with sadness that Linda won't be coming back, but slightly disagree with her on why the Terminator franchise is now dead and buried. But look, guys, I shall move on swiftly. I'm going to cut this topic out that I was about to speak about because I don't know much about the original movie anyway. And uh, quite frankly, I can't add anything. It was about Little uh, Horror, House of Horrors or something, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, But I'm going to move on to this one that intrigues me a great deal more. It's all about Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley getting an official synopsis and character descriptions as filming begins. This one's coming in from Collider.com. And yes, it's Guillermo del Toro's next project. Of course, he worked as a a producer on Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. This is his first feature-length movie since the immensely successful and Academy Award-winning Shape of Water. And look, I have to say I'm very excited about this movie. It is a horror movie again, I do believe. And it has got an absolutely stacked cast. Bradley Cooper's in there. Kate Blanchett is in there. Kim Morgan has co-wrote it. And uh, it's based on a novel by William Lindsay Graham. And it's all about an ambitious young carny, Bradley Cooper. That is, with a talent for manipulating people with a few well-chosen words, hooking up with a female psychiatrist who is even more dangerous than he is. Now, it's a very short and sweet synopsis, but already it has me hooked. When you combine the acting talents of Bradley Cooper and Kate Blanchett, probably the greatest female actress living today, out with maybe a Meryl Streep, with the directing talents of Guillermo del Toro, and you pair that with a cast that features Runa Mari, William Defoe, Ron Perlman, working once again with Guillermo, and also Richard Jenkins, uh, some high society, high fluting, wealthy industrialist guy. Man, I'm excited about that concoction we're getting here. And he is working again with people he's worked with before. Louis Sequera, who is a costume designer. Dan Lawston, who is the cinematographer. He's worked with him many, many times. I think this could be a match made in heaven. I'm very excited about it to see what this guy can bring to the table once again. We know he's a great director. He doesn't have to prove himself to anyone. But even the, the title, Nightmare Alley, my God. And look, William Defoe's in there. I love this man. I watched Togo. And I'm supremely excited about what this guy has got to bring to the table in this movie again. He's such a talented actor. I cannot believe he wasn't nominated in some vein for that performance in The Lighthouse, incidentally. I've just seen it and it was mind blown and it's magnificent. So yeah, I'm excited for that, man, and I am going to move on. I've gave my thoughts on it to the next and potentially the last topic, um, and it is coming from Variety, and it's about Ron Howard uh, being set to direct an action thriller called The Fixer for Paramount Studios. Now, they have says that the man has just finished working on Netflix's Hillbilly Elegy, um, and look, I'm excited for that as well. That's the next big Netflix release after The Irishman. Um, and what a direct- you speak about great directors Ron Howard man this guy going all the way back to the likes of Willow uh, and I'm sure he did something that I know prior to that obviously did a poll of living as well Phen- phenomenally talented guy he's working under the, the production banner of Imagine Entertainment he will produce it alongside Bradley Cooper and Todd Phillips uh, with Andrew Pinay coming in as well again stellar production team there backing up a Nicolay stellar directing choice for Paramount Pictures um, the original pitch was made by, or pre- uh, originally pitched by Tyler Heisel, and the film is about the incredible true story of a disgraced FBI agent who, at the height of the Cold War, is tapped by the CIA to lead a ragtag team of CIA operatives and Chicago mobsters on an unlikely mission to 
try and assassinate Cuban's great leader, Fidel Castro. Uh, I probably will put off a sizable proportion of the people who watch my shows by saying or uttering that last word. But Fidel Castro, uh, or Fidel Castro, if I can say his name right, was a truly great man. Uh, big fan of him <laughs> and Che Guevara, despite some of the atrocities they committed. Look, every great person uh, commits atrocities, man. There's not a United States president in the history of man who hasn't got a kill list on him to get to that position. So, uh, yeah, I'm intrigued by this, man. I'm intrigued by the, the story and the, the concept of a disgraced FBI agent leading some CIA espionage mission to try and go and kill Fidel Castro in Cuba. It sounds incredible. It's a period piece. We know that Ron can do period pieces. The script is being penned uh, right now and it's a project with top priority for the studio. I can't wait to see this Hillbilly Elgy movie. I cannot wait to see how he adapts this goddamn novel as well. Um, the man is just gold, really. I don't think he's made a bad movie. Well, he probably has made a bad movie. I'm probably getting a little bit, how shall I put it, hyperbolic in my assessment of his abilities, but he's such a good director. Uh, and this joint effort of Todd Phillips and Bradley Cooper coming hot off the heels of their collaboration on the Joker. Magic's going to happen here. I know it is. Incidentally, Hillbilly Al- Al- Allegi, look at the cast that has. Amy Adams, Glenn Close, Haley Bennett, Frida Pinto. <sighs> wow. This man's on a bit of a streak just now. He came off the heels of, obviously, directing so a Star Wars story. That got a lot of shit flung at it, but that man came in and saved the day uh, big time. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed that movie. It wasn't as bad as people made out. So look, I'm excited for that as well. I'm very excited today. Uh, I can't hold my excitement in. There's so many exciting news articles dropping about movies which I didn't even know about, man. And now I know about them. My anticipatory juices are flowing evermore. But I am going to round up the article section of today's show and swiftly move on to the blog rundown section of the show. Uh, quite frankly... Haven't seen any of these movies, I'm not going to lie, but it's a, a trio of movies from the magnificent writer that is Peter Plumers, or Plumers. First one's The Silence, and it stars Stanley Tucci, Kiernan Shipka, and Miranda Watto. Uh, I don't know much about it, um, it's kind of like a, a post-apocalyptic a quiet place with these horrific monster creatures flying around bloodthirstily and ruthlessly trying to kill people left, right and centre. You could say that's like the Wuhan coronavirus at the moment with those videos of about 20,000 crows flying around trying to get torn into dead bodies. But look, I am not going to make that comparison at all. Look, if it's a quiet place with Stanley Tucci, then I'm on board. Certainly, I urge you to go and give this man's review a read. Um, He does say all in all the film was weakest. Uh, The weakest one from Netflix original stable, uh, he says as a horror, it's a total failure. It's never really scary or exciting. The tension's removed. You get the gist. He doesn't like it, so look, I digress. Maybe Stanley Tucci and A Quiet Place combined isn't something I want to see after all. I take it back immediately. But look, I shall move on to the middle review in today's and this week's blog rundown. And it is Ben is back. This is another review from Peter Plummers, as I did say, a trilogy of reviews from the man this week. This one stars, it looks like, Julia Roberts and Lucas Hedges. And it's about addictions, not abductions, and destructive effects that that has on family life, personal well-being. He does lightly, or rightly, compare this uh, with Beautiful Boy, which is obviously that great Steve Carell and Timothy Chalamet movie. Um, and that made a real crushing impression on me recently as well, incidentally. Peter, uh, look, I love these movies. Um, I've seen it with Manchester by the Sea as well. Real poignant, heart-wrenching, drama-driven movies about addiction and just depression and mental health and whatnot and how it degrades the family unit. I'm on board for this, man. I didn't know it existed. Um, obviously, I didn't think the movie impressed him as much as A Beautiful Boy, but A Beautiful Boy was magic. It was a fantastic movie and it's got... Probably a better cast. Although Julia is a fantastic actress. She's proven it time and again. Yeah, man. I mean, he says no drug campaign can match this. And I completely agree. The power of movie is that it can touch so many more demographics than any government drug campaign. And look, it's a tragedy when drugs and addiction destroys the family unit. So I ain't got much more to say about that. I will give that one a watch. I'm really intrigued by it. Another one I'm intrigued by is Zoo, which is the next review. Just by that poster alone, really. 
Um, saving a marriage during a zombie apocalypse is not an easy task, is the synopsis. Um, well, this one's coming in from Antonio Tublin, the director. It stars Zoe Tapper, Ed Spielers, Antonio Campbell Hughes in it. And yes, it is another zombie horror genre movie. I think Peter did El Bar last week, which was a foreign language Madrid set kind of similar horror story. I don't think it was a zombie story. But yeah, uh, this is a Swedish production, incidentally. I, I've never heard of it. Certainly can't really speak about it from an artistic merit. But I do, once again, urge you to go and read the man's review on our blog rundown at movieburnerentertainment.org. I urge you to catch all of the reviews, if you, if you can. My nose is about to start blocking up again here, so I'm going to call it quits here. Well... I am marginally ahead. Uh, by saying that that is the end of today's vlog rundown and indeed the end of today's MBE movie news. I don't know why I flung in MBE. What was your thoughts on the initial reactions to Birds of Prey or the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn? Are you excited about this movie? Are you excited about DC's new strategy? strategy strategic process, I was about to say. That is too convoluted. What do you make about Nicolas Cage doing HP Lovecraft? Tackling incandescent lights and tentacle wielding aliens. What is your thoughts about Linda Hamilton and her comments about not caring about coming back to the role of Sarah Connor and about the death of the Terminator franchise? What's your thoughts on Guillermo del Toro and Ron Howard doing new movies? If you get anything to say at all, you can comment below and let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments section. You can also like the video if you've enjoyed it and you can subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content. And if you do, then you'll see me again speaking a hundred mile hours at the end of a show and probably tomorrow as well if you subscribe for our review of Jamie Foxx and Michael B. Jordan's Just Mercy. See you then guys.